Hi there and a very warm welcome to this week's quick tip. This is another short one and it connects directly to last week. Since I hinted at Ray Epsilon, I thought this week might be a good point to get this tackled. This will be a very theoretical episode, so if you fall asleep easily, please prepare coffee now. You've been warned. And here are a couple of examples why this is the way it is. If you render something and you have big borders around the corners of objects, what you just saw is the wrong setting and now that's the right setting. If you have transparencies like glass or a soap bubble in this case and your object looks solid, this is the soap bubble how it should look. And the same with glass. So if your glass looks kind of weird and uh, not realistic at all, you can change the Ray Epsilon to get a better result. All of those examples are precision values where the precision isn't fine enough, but there's the opposite ways. Sometimes the precision is too fine. So if you have a landscape, for example, and I adjusted it to be roughly real world scale. So this mountain is really high, a couple of hundred meters, and it reaches far in the background. And you can see those strange lines appearing here. And with the right Ray Epsilon adjustments, they disappear. And this is the same landscape from above. So you can see those concentric rings. And concentric rings also is a big indicator that you are dealing with some Ray Epsilon problems. And with the adjustment, this is looking just fine. So I hear you asking, where is this Ray Epsilon and how can I set it up correctly? So first of all, I will show you where to find it. It's in the Octane settings on the kernels. You can find the Ray Epsilon here and be prepared that every kernel has its own Ray Epsilon setting. So if you switch kernels a lot, be cautious to always set up the right Ray Epsilon value again in the new kernel. But now on to the main part, how is the Ray Epsilon working and how to set it up correctly. So welcome to presentation land where I go over the inner workings of the Ray Epsilon in a stylized manner to hopefully make it more understandable. So we have our graphic of a glass here again and one ray is hitting the glass and the red hit point here is visible. And we have a circle outside of the hit point, and this is the Ray Epsilon radius. So when we zoom into the glass wall, you can see that we are following the refraction rays. Of course, there would also be reflection rays, but since all ray types are dealing the same way with Ray Epsilon, I'm just sticking to one ray type, in this case, the refraction rays. So if we follow the ray coming into the surface, we can see there's a hit point where the ray hits the polygon and then there's a refraction happening and the new ray is then calculated in trajectory by Snell's law. You might remember that from the old tutorial I did. So when the ray is hitting the first wall here, the ray epsilon will offset the newly calculated ray by the amount you set in the ray epsilon to avoid conflicts with the polygon wall here. So to avoid double intersection and so on. So the newly calculated rays are always offset by the distance you set in the ray epsilon. So by increasing the ray epsilon number, you can increase the gap between the hit point and the origin point of the newly created ray. This might seem a bit counterproductive because you want to have the most precision, and the most precision would be to have the ray created as closely to the hit point as possible. But I will go over why widening the ray epsilon radius is a good idea in some situations. But first we will be looking at the ray epsilon if it's too thick. So we will be following the ray here and the hit point is calculated correctly, but the ray epsilon radius is so big that the second hit point is ignored because the ray is generated after that point. And then with the trajectory of the calculated first point moves on that direction. 
That means that every object that where the second hit point and therefore the thin wall is ignored will look as if it was solid. Just remember the example with a soap bubble, which is made of a very thin second wall inside. And if this ray epsilon radius is too thick, so you will miss the second refraction and therefore the bubble will look like solidly filled with whatever material you have given it. So you say, this is cool and all, but why would you ever increase the ray epsilon radius? This is the part where I explain that we living off of limited resources. Basically, what Octane and GPU rendering is doing is single precision floating point calculations. That means we have 32 address spaces in our memory for every number that can be either a 1 or a 0. And since we only got 32 of them, the precision of the number is limited. Since computer scientists are very clever, they decided to have this number represented as a floating point number. That means that you can take the point and move it to any part of the number. But this has advantages and disadvantages again. Because you can either have a very, very high precise number with uh, lots of fraction digits behind the point, or you can have a very large number with very little precision. Explaining how single floating point precision works would be overdoing it here. Within 3D, we would always need high precisions, even with higher numbers, because some points of our scene are maybe very far away from the origin and therefore in the axis of this point has a really high number. So the higher the number, the lower the precision. But if you didn't understand that, I have an example for that also. So if we are having a plane where one ray is reflecting, but this plane is very far away from the camera, we are losing precision because the number from the points on the plane are bigger and therefore we have less digits to store as precision values. So what happens is that the ray intersection point cannot be calculated as precisely anymore. The red zone with the different points there all could be the point where the exact intersection is happening. But we don't know because the precision is missing. So what happens if we just pick one point and do our calculations with a small ray epsilon radius from there? Well, we might end up hitting the plane that we are reflecting off of from the back side. Because the precision was lacking and the point that actually was calculated was inside of the plane. And therefore, of course, we will getting the completely wrong ray direction because the backside of the plane will be reflecting the ray in a completely different direction than it actually needed to do. And therefore we get artifacts and wrong values in our pixels. So for those situations, it is actually a good idea to have a bigger ray epsilon radius that helps to make the ray escape that situations no matter where the errors or the imprecise calculation puts it. The further away the camera from the object and the further away the object from the scene origin, the higher the ray epsilon radius value has to be to compensate for the loss in precision due to the higher numbers that the points are having. So back here in 3D, let's actually talk about how to find the right value for your ray epsilon. The rule of thumb here is to make it as small as possible without provoking artifacts. So for me, for example, I'm working with very small scenes usually that are the size of tabletops or smaller. So I can go with very small values that give me the highest precision possible. So I can go and just use the slider and put it to the most left position. And with most of my scenes, that works great. But if you're doing interior visualization and have room-sized objects, that might already cause problems. So let's go to our landscape example here and render that. So with the ray epsilon, what you want to do is find the smallest number that works for you. 
So of course you can go about and just delete zeros out here to make the value larger. And one deleted zero already works, but might be that you can get away with even lower values. So if we just change the one here at the end to a two, you can see that this already works and you're not losing as much precision as with the other way. So as I said, just make sure you're using the smallest ray epsilon possible without provoking artifacts in your renders and you should be fine most of the time. I say most of the time because there are some special cases where you have a very large zoom from a very small object to a very large world, for example, where one ray epsilon is not enough. And there's a trick for that too. So you can open up the render settings here and check the override kernel settings. And while this value here in the octane settings isn't animatable, this one here is. So while you're zooming out with your camera, you could animate your ray epsilon to have always the right precision for the distance from the camera from your objects. And this pretty much wraps it up. So if you have any ideas for new tutorials and quick tip, just write them down in the comments below. Other than that, it's just my usual stuff. Thank you very much for sticking with me. A good week, a good time and happy floating. Bye.